about to start <laughs> Sunday school. Welcome everyone, welcome all of our visitors, our church family. So uh, the ushers, if they would come on up, we'll get the offering collected this morning. I do have, wait, I just need to ask Brother Daniels, I don't, no, not you, the other one. Hey, Brother Daniels, I don't want to steal your glory, but I do have a joke, if you don't mind. Okay? While they're collecting the offering. So, what did Jonah's family say when he told them about what happened before reaching Nineveh? Hmm, sounds fishy. I thought that was good. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, last week... We started a new series. Erica did a wonderful job teaching on how to pray, and we're going to continue with that series today. Our lesson title is The Invitation to Pray. And, you know, I do, before we get started on our lesson, I do have just a small testimony, and I think it's, it's important and it's appropriate that I share this with you because of, you know, the message Brother Gene taught us last week you know, about connecting and reconnecting and supporting one another. But, you know, um, Jade graduated from high school last month along with seven or eight other people. And, you know, the, the only blood relative at her graduation was me. That was it. And, of course, you know, Rob and Luke were there. And she had an aunt that showed up. And, you know, we, there was more family members that we um, felt could have came or should have came. But you know what? Jade had two full rows of people that attended her graduation because of this church. And I just want to thank every one of you who came to her graduation, who came to her graduation party after church, the ones of you who showed up and supported during the graduation party here at church, I just want to say thank you so much. That meant so much to us. I love this church. You guys are amazing, and you just, you know, you made something that, you know, we could have had a pity party about, not. It was a blessing, and I just want to thank you for that today. So, anyways, um, the invitation to pray. Our... Lesson text comes from Matthew chapter 9, and I am going to read it today, verses 35, 9, 35, and 10 through 8. So it says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye, pray ye. Therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these, the first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus and Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus. Simon the Canaanite, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who has also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, Cast out dev devils, 
Freely ye have received, freely give. And our focus verse comes from um, verses 37 and 38. <clears throat> and the truth about God is that he invites us into his harvest. He invites us into the harvest. Therefore, the truth for my life is that we must pray and we must labor. So we're just going to pray real quick before we get into this lesson. Jesus, Lord, we thank you for another day. We thank you for this opportunity to be at this house of worship, to talk about you, to lift you up, to praise you, to bless you, Lord. And I pray that your word will do its work today, God. I pray that hearts will be prepared to receive this word in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we know that Jesus was a compassionate man. And his life works attest to that. And the, the text that we read covers a period of time when Jesus had just finished up a very, very busy week. He had healed a paralyzed man from palsy, recruited Matthew as a disciple, healed a woman who had been chronically ill for 12 long years, raised a 12-year-old girl from the dead, and as he was leaving her house, he healed two blind men that were following him. And as if that weren't enough, another crowd awaited him and presented him a mute man possessed with a devil. And of course, Jesus cast out the devil, heals the man, and he speaks. And everyone's amazed, but we can probably guess that that was a pretty exhausting week for the Lord. But it didn't stop the people from showing up. You know, as he traveled to villages and synagogues, Everywhere people were weary, in need, and scattered. And Matthew records it like sheep having no shepherd. And so when Jesus saw these people, he was moved with compassion. Their hurts, their needs, it hurt him. And he knew what every shepherd knows, that every sheep needs a shepherd. Psalm 79 and 13 says, so we thy people and sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. 95 and 7, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. 100 verse 3, know ye not that the Lord he is God? It is not he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We are sheep in need of a shepherd. And Jesus made it clear in John 10, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And just as they wondered and they needed Jesus back then, we still do so today. And so I ran across this little video probably a couple of years ago, and it, couldn't, it just couldn't be more accurate when depicting the shepherd and sheep relationship. So I'm going to share it with you today, and then we'll just talk about it just a little bit. So... Have, can anybody identify as a sheep today? Say, bad. <laughs> okay. Have you ever found life to be that way? You know, you're just wandering around as a sheep, jumping out of one mess and right into the another. And he may pull us out, you know, of that mess we just jumped into, and we'll just still jump back. But, you know, God knew what he was doing when he likened us unto sheep, okay? There's an article that I came across in Christian Living, and it's called Dumb, Directionless, and Defenseless. Does that sound familiar? Are any of you brave enough to identify with that? <laughs> so, but I'm going to share with you what he wrote about sheep. It says, do a little bit of reading about sheep, and you'll soon see that they are not survivors. They are not strong and independent creatures, not proud hunters or fierce predators. They're actually kind of pathetic, entirely dependent upon a shepherd for at least three reasons. Two, 
have to do with the brain of the sheep, and one to, is related to its body. So this is a real news story that aptly tells the first reason sheep need a shepherd because sheep are dumb. Hundreds of sheep followed their leader off a cliff in eastern Turkey, plunging to their deaths this week while shepherds looked on in dismay. 400 sheep fell 15 meters to their deaths in a ravine near Iran, but broke the fall of another 1,100 animals who survived. Shepherds from a nearby village neglected the flock while eating breakfast, leaving the sheep to roam free. The loss to local farmers was estimated at $74,000. One sheep wandered off a cliff and 1,499 others just followed along. And can you picture it? 1,500 sheep, each walking off a cliff, one after the other. Soon they were piled so deep that the bottom ones were crushed to death and the ones on top were just lying on a big, soft, downy pillow. It is completely absurd and tells us one important fact about sheep. And the first reason sheep absolutely need a shepherd, they are not the smartest animals in the world. In fact, they may well be just about the dumbest animals in the world. And here's the second reason sheep need a shepherd. They are directionless. Sheep are prone to wander. Even if you put them in an absolutely perfect environment with everything they need, if a shepherd doesn't manage them, if he doesn't micromanage them and keep them under constant surveillance, they will wander off and be lost. Sheep are also defenseless. Left to themselves, sheep will not and cannot last very long. Just about any other domesticated animal can be returned to the wild and will stand a fighting chance of survival, but not a sheep. Put a sheep in the wild and you've just given nature a snack. So there are, there are different ways animals react when they perceive some kind of danger. Fight, flight, and posture. So if you think about fight, a sheep gets frightened or sees that he's in danger, maybe he sees a bear rambling towards him. Maybe he, what is he going to do? He doesn't have claws. He doesn't have fangs. He doesn't have venom. And he doesn't have spines or quills or large talons. He's got nothing to protect himself. Fighting is definitely out. But that's okay. There are a lot of animals that don't fight it out. How about flight? Just turn tail and run. That's a good defense mechanism. But unfortunately, sheep aren't fast. They certainly aren't agile, especially when their wool is long, and even more so when their wool is long and wet. And last I checked, they don't have wings. A sheep is not going to outrun or outfly a bear. The sheep will not fight, and it cannot flight. So far, it's looking pretty good for the bear. So how about posture? A dog will bark and growl and show his teeth to warn you away. A lion will roar. A rattlesnake, he'll shake his rattle, and a cat will arch his back and hiss. The best a sheep can do is... Bah, that's right. I don't think that a bear is going to be too intimidated it is good reason that no one relies on a guard sheep to keep their property secure. So we know that sheep can't fight, they can't run away, they can't scare away. So what does a sheep do when danger comes? It flocks. When a bear approaches, the sheep will gather with others in a pack and they'll run in circles in complete panic, just hoping that the bear will choose someone else. But without a shepherd to protect them, they'll be picked off and eaten one by one. Sheep are dumb and directionless and defenseless. So I guess when God says that we are sheep who need a shepherd, he doesn't mean it as a compliment to us. It is just a very realistic assessment of who we are and what we need. We are sheep who are completely dependent upon a shepherd. And to say that God is our shepherd and we are sheep is to humble ourselves admitting what is true about us and to elevate God declaring what is true of him. So when you say the Lord is my shepherd, you are saying something that 
that just ought to move your heart in praise and gratitude. To declare that God is your shepherd is to praise and glorify him because God is the shepherd that stoops down and pulls us out of our mess, even knowing we may jump right back into it. And he cares for the poor. He cares for the lost. He cares for not so smart sheep like me and you. And these facts, they can be funny yet humbling as we really understand what fragile beings we are and how we have been designed to totally and completely depend on the Lord. You know, David, he gave us the perfect word picture for the shepherd-sheep relationship when he penned Psalms 23. And if you've ever walked through a season of loneliness or emptiness, nothingness, you feel vulnerable, you feel weak, you feel confused, or, you know, maybe life has just changed so much that you came to the realization that truly, truly the only thing that doesn't change is our Lord and His Word. And, you, you know, you begin to understand that He is our rock. He is our firm foundation. He is our stability. He is our shepherd. You know, this passage, it becomes so much more to you than a pretty picture on a wall or a verse well read that you recite it by heart. But it so accurately depicts the relationship between us and our Lord. And I think that it's always a good time to read and meditate on the truth of this word. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And you know, Jesus knew. He knew we needed a shepherd. And as Jesus was moved with compassion for people and knew that they had needs that only he could supply, we also must recognize those in need around us who are dumb, who are directionless, and who are defenseless. We must be moved with compassion for people who are weary and scattered. You know, we have to ask the Lord to help us to see them and hear them and care for them, to weep and pray for them. If God Almighty wasn't too busy to notice and even rescue, then neither should we be. And, you know, take note that when Jesus was, when he encountered people, his first actions weren't to try to give them a Bible study or, you know, have them come to church or listen to him t teach. But the first thing he did was he met them at their need. He touched their physical lives before he reached into their spiritual lives. You know, showing compassion for others, it isn't always, <clears throat> in fact, it's very seldom a big spiritual display. But, you know, we like those moments. We like to look for those opportunities to give someone a word or a powerful moment of prayer or be the one that delivers that on-time confirmation. You know, we like those opportunities, but that's not where most people live. That's not where compassion typically shows up as an opportunity to be had. And recently I was visiting with an individual, and they were sharing with me their story about <clears throat> addiction. And part of their story that caused me to just pause and ponder was when they were, ta they were talking about a time they were living in a recovery facility, but they had been out on pass to just go get some food and things that they had need. And when they entered a store, they noticed. They noticed this woman, homeless, strung out on the street in front of the store, looking gaunt, dehydrated. She had burns on her feet because the pavement is so hot. They were unsure if she, you know, really was even in her right mind. But they just went into the store and proceeded 
to buy items for this woman. Tea, water, bread, chips, just from what I remember. But when they came out and offered it to the lady, she was like, well, I really don't like tea and water. And, and this individual, she, they were like, okay, well, what do you like? I can, I can go back in and get you things. There's Gatorade and lemonade and energy drinks. I'll just go grab something else. And they proceeded to purchase more things. But when they came out, the woman, she was sitting there just gulping, gulping down the tea and the water. And as they were telling me this story, they said, you know, I didn't receive a lot of gratitude or even a thank you from this lady. But when I came out, she was, you know, gulping down those drinks that I gave her. And I knew that what I'd done wasn't in vain. And she, she said, you know, it made me feel good. It made me feel good that I was able to offer her some help. And what made me pause and ponder was the fact that this individual who was offering this help, who was showing compassion, was in such a great state of need themselves. You know, they were wondering. They were lost. They were directionless. They were in rehab, still using, but still being used by God to feel mercy, to feel empathy, to show compassion. For, for this woman. And don't dismiss this story because of the circumstances surrounding it. Because I'm going to take you to, to some scripture that says why. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom of God prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we the, thee a hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. You know, compassion is a ministry. It's, it's not just to the giver and the recipient, but it's also to the Lord. And just as the Lord chose us in our humanity, we must choose others in their humanity. You know, there are multiple opportunities that surround us every day to extend help and hope to someone else. And probably 99% of the time, no one else will ever know what you did, you know, or said or offered to someone. But God knows. God knows because it was as if you'd done it to him. Amen? Don't ever underestimate the power of compassion. It's far more than food, clothing, and shelter. You know, most people I know, they have little deficits in these areas, but they are still hurting. They are still scattered. They're still confused. They're still grieving, scared, and lonely. Compassion, it takes the form of a gentle touch of the hand and a listening ear, or a tender hug and an understanding heart. It's a prayer for their wayward child or sick spouse. It's a 30-minute visit, maybe a five-minute phone call. But not only does compassion benefit others, but it also benefits you. You know, psychology today defines the benefits of compassion as follows. By expressing compassion, not only does the recipient of the compassion benefit, but so too does the one giving compassion. Some of the many benefits to the person expressing compassion include reduced levels of cellular inflammation. Increased perceptions of happiness and an experience of pleasure. A buffering effect against stress. An increase in longevity. A broadening ability to see a wider perspective outside of oneself. And increasing feelings of social connection. Connection. There's that word again. Connection. We heard about it last Sunday. You know, and if compassion, if this, you know, this may be the miracle drug that some of us need to heal our own 
human needs and ailments. You know, according to this study, it has medicinal values. You know, if giving a little extra attention, time, resources, you know, to someone, if it will help my aching joints, you know, I'm all for it. You know, if it will lift my spirits and bring some joy into my life, you know, just you can, guys can just sign me up. I will not turn that down. But these are things that, <clears throat> that money cannot buy, and I know because I've tried, but there are immediate and eternal benefits when we live God's way. Amen? So God is calling us to be moved with compassion. He is calling us to greater connection. Amen? So the, the beginning of this lesson, it dealt with shepherding. The second, the second part of this lesson, it deals with farming. So I'm going to move from shepherding to farming. But in our focus verse, Jesus, he moved from shepherding to farming. And this is where the main uh, heart of this lesson stems from. So according to the word of God, the harvest truly is plentiful. It's plentiful. You know, the crowds were spread in front of him like a field of ready-to-be-reaped grain. And Jesus saw them as people ready to come into the kingdom of God. And he stood as a farmer looking towards the field and the barn, realizing there is no one to work the fields. If there is to be a harvest, he will have to do all the work. He doesn't need more grain, but what he needs is more help. That is when Jesus made his request. The disciples listened as everyone was bringing their wish list to Jesus. Heal her, fix him, help them. We need food, we need healing, we need sight, we need deliverance. You name it, they needed it. But towards the end of a wearisome, busy week, Jesus had a request of his own. He turned to his disciples, and the king of kings was about to ask for something from 12 very ordinary men. After all, people had been shouting demands at Jesus all week. What do you want, Jesus? Name it and we'll do it. Is it rest? We can arrange that. You need a chariot? We'll call the nearest dealership and have it delivered. What do you want, Jesus? And you know, the Lord, he softly said, according to Matthew 9 and 38, pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth the laborers into his harvest. The first step into reaching this bountiful arm harvest and filling the barn is to pray. We must pray for God to send forth laborers, including us, into the harvest. And I know, I know some of you are involved in multiple ministries. Some of you may be just one. And some of you may be praying for direction, you know, on how you can be involved in the kingdom. But no matter, no matter how busy you are already or not, there is one thing, one thing, I quote, one thing that we all can do and we can pray. You know, back on April 7th, Pastor, he stood up here one Sunday and he put forth a cry for help around the church. And just in case you don't remember, in case you weren't here, I'm going to play a snippet of that for you today. Just one thing, church. Just one thing. You know, I've come today to continue that cry for help and ask you to pray. If you are already doing multiple things or you aren't doing anything, you can do one thing. You can pray for laborers. You know, Jesus made his request, Pastor made his request. And I'm carrying that call to this church today. Pray, pray for laborers, pray for help, pray for the Lord to raise up people, 
Stir their hearts to work in the fields. Don't be surprised that as you pray, if he moves on you and he says, you are the man or woman for the job, just one thing, church, pray. You know, here's a simple truth, yet it's revelatory in a sense. We can't have full barns without full fields. We can't have full barns without full fields. Pastor was once praying one Sunday morning before church for God to fill the house, send revival, fill the pews, Lord. And quickly the Lord convicted him and led him to pray for a full field, not just a full house. You know, it's impressive when there's not an empty seat in the house, when there's standing room only, and people have to park in the grass or in the front parking lot around here. That's a good problem, as we like to say, and it is. But God is pleased when the field is full, not just the barn. When his people are carrying the gospel into the world. When people hear and heed the call to give up their comforts of their home, and the living, and they live in the life of a traveling evangelist or missionary, maybe you can open up your home to a Bible study group, a prayer group, or just, just a place of fellowship and faith. He's not impressed with large youth groups, but he is impressed when students from any size youth group unlock their faith at school, or when you extend compassion and witness to your neighbor, or stop and pray and encourage those you work with, When our vision lifts from full barns to full fields, our prayers will shift and we will fulfill the request of Jesus and pray for the Lord to send laborers, to send us into the harvest. Just one thing, pray. This this is an invitation to prayer. Jesus' prayer request still stands after 2,000 years. He is still calling us to pray for laborers in his field. The field is massive. According to Matthew 13 and 38, Jesus said, the field is the world. The field is across the street as well as across the world. It's our schools, our factories where we work, the bank, the shops where we shop. It's our home, where we live. And I feel confident in saying this is the most important field God has called us to labor in. We are first and foremost missionaries in our own homes. We are called to promote faith and serve those that we live with, those whom we love most, share our lives and our home with. So in all your laboring, don't neglect to labor for those whom God has committed into your care and brought into your life. You know, Sister Judy, our home, it is our number one field of ministry. And I want to... I want to give kudos to Sister Cheyenne. You know, she's really brought a great awareness, at least for me, into the world of missionary ministry. And I enjoy her monthly updates and the focus, you know, that probably otherwise it would never cross my mind. But as we pray for labors, he often sends labors to us because he loves every, every square inch of his field. You know, I've seen this happen so many times over the years. It happened at my former church. I've seen it happen here. But, you know, God will move people on in life, people who hold strategic positions, people who you can always depend on, and you think, how in the world are we going to make it without them? How will this get done? Who will do this now? And inevitably, God will send someone else who is just as much of a benefit to the assembly or raise someone else up in the church that is fully capable of filling any void left by others. When, that, when, we see Jesus, when we see that Jesus answered his own prayer request as he gathered his faithful yet sometimes faithless disciples around him and gave them their marching orders, but he also gave them power, power to cast out devils, unclean spirits, heal all sickness and disease, He was multiplying his reach by empowering his followers to do what he was doing. It's said often, but it's so true, 
as evidenced by this passage of Scripture, whom he calls, he also equips. He's not going to leave us without the tools we need to gather in the harvest. He's given us his own spirit to lead, God teach, and power, power to do exploits even. Daniel eleven thirty two. 32, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits, power to do greater things than he did, according to John 14 and 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, he shall do also and greater works than these because I go to my father. Our job is to answer the call. The Lord will provide the rest. He will provide us the spiritual authority to do what he was doing. And by doing this, you know, he was exemplifying empowering leadership to his disciples. Leaders who care more about the mission than recognition. You know, Jesus, he didn't mind at all that Peter and Andrew could pray the prayer of faith and cast out demons because he knew his work that he started would continue on far past Calvary. And you know, we have been called and empowered by God to carry out his mission and make disciples for him. He not only gave his disciples the power and authority to harvest the field, he also gave them clear direction. Matthew 10, 5 through 6, after he gave them power, he said, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And although the disciples would eventually preach the gospel to the Gentiles and in Samaria with God confirming his word in all those places, Jesus called them to start where they were. We are called to start where we are in our homes, our jobs, in Salem, in Kinmundi, Iuka, Alma, in West Frankfurt even. You know, start where you are. Clock in and say, yes, Lord, I will pray. I will labor. I will go. And it may seem glamorous traveling the world and sharing the gospel with people who speak another language, but before we do that, we are called to start right where we are. No one knows us like our family and friends, our coworkers. No one can see the transformation that God has wrought in our lives more than they will. You know, I'm about done, but I do want to say this. When I first came to Salem, my goal, it was to work at Salem Township Hospital. You know, that's where I was living. That's where I was going to church. And I wanted to become acquainted with the members of this community. You know, I had an excellent resume and job history, and I just knew, I just knew that's where I was going to land. But as I was job searching and turning in my resumes, I never once, not one time, received a call from Salem Hospital. Nothing. No inquiry, no email, you're not qualified, you know, nothing. But I was immediately contacted by Good Sam. And ultimately, that's where I ended up, and I've been there for 12 years. And you know what? That's where I was supposed to be. That's where I was supposed to be. And come to think of it, he already had laborers at Salem Township Hospital. There were already people working there, you know, that went to this church. He wanted me at Good Sam. And only God knows how many times I've had a patient or family member look at me and say, you're right where you're supposed to be. And only God knows, because I am not going to break confidence, but only God knows how many of your friends, your family, your sons, your daughters that I have met, I've had encounters with, I've had conversations with, I've prayed with people who are connected or were once connected to this church or even walked in the apostolic faith. For that matter, when I first moved here, people um, mistake, mistaken me for Sherry Tipsword. I can't tell you how many times I was asked if I used to play the piano down in Cesar or something, wherever that was. I, I said, no, that's not me. Now, they, now everybody thinks I'm her mother. But, <laughs> but anyways, you know, God gave me that job for reasons that far exceeds its abilities to pay my bills. And until he says otherwise, that's my field. You know, home is first. 
That's where I spend 40 hours a week. You know, that's where I labor. That's where I've been called to show compassion and to work the harvest that he has prepared. So if you would, let's stand. And today, I hope you choose to make a commitment to pray and answer the call to be a laborer in the harvest field. Pastor, he lamented on April 7th. And as Jesus lamented 2,000 years ago, I stand here today and say we can do one thing. We can pray and we can respond by saying, yes, Lord, I will go. As we pray today, be sure to open up your heart and receive the calling God has put forth today and help him bring in the harvest. Lord Jesus, I'm so grateful, God, that your word is so true. It's so alive, Lord. And God, we hear your call today, Lord, 2,000 years later, Lord. We know, God, that the harvest is plentiful, Lord. There's many, many things to do, many people to reach, many hearts to touch, God. We know, Lord, that there's still people to be saved. And God, I pray today that you just speak to our hearts, Lord, and that we answer the call, God, that we will go, that we will be used, that we will pray, Lord. And we know that you'll take care of us, God. And we pray, Lord, that you bless the remainder of this service, bless those preaching, teaching, singing, God. Let your spirit have its way. In Jesus' name, amen.